Today, we are going to introduce time series and forecasting. This will include new definitions, new notations, and new methods. Until now, we've looked at cross-sectional data. In cross-sectional data, each observation is a different unit. So each observation could be a different movie, a different video game, a different player. And we're looking at the relationship between some dependent variable, y, and one or many explanatory variables, x. In that case, we are looking at how the relation is across the different units. So how, for instance, a movie revenue change from one movie to another movie. In a time series, it's different. We only have one unit, but the value for the dependent variable changes over time. So for instance, we can look at one specific stock price and this stock price value changes from one moment to the next. Or if we're looking at closing price, it changes from one trading day to the next trading day. We can think of many other variables that change uh, over time, like economic indicators or uh, the number of bookings you got this month in one hotel. And in that case, we can have, again, many uh, explanatory variables, but what matters is that they are changing over time. Now, there is a third type of data where you have both many units and they all change over time. This is called panel data, but we are not covering it in this course. Now that we have defined what time series are, we can talk about forecasting. Forecasting is simply predicting future states of the world based on the historical trends and relationships. So you can understand what relationship we have between some variables and time and the current state. When we say predicting future states of the world, usually it's predicting the value of the dependent variable ahead of time. The goal is to make predictions that are accurate, of course, that are out of sample, so we don't know what happened yet, and as early as possible. It's important to remember that it's not because something happened before another thing that you have causality, right? For instance, uh, for movie budgets and movie revenue, the budget is decided before the film release, but it might be decided according to what we expect the movie to be uh, and how good it will be. And as a consequence, how much revenue it will generate. So it might still depend on the expected revenue. So in that case, even though the budget comes before the revenue, it might still depend on what the revenue will be. So it doesn't cause the revenue. Let's talk about the notation. We have a variable of interest, y. It's the dependent variable. And it changes over time, and so we are going to use t to represent the time period. It could be in weeks, in quarters, in business days. It's a kind of time unit. Then when we put y with the index t, it, d, it means that it's the value of y observed at that time t. So y1 would be the first observation we have usually, and Y capital T is the last observation. And in between we have Y2, Y3, and so on and so forth. Then when we make a prediction, it's not the actual Y, we are predicting ahead of time. We are denoting it F for forecast. And then we have two indices. First, we have uh, T minus K, which is the period in which the forecast was made, and then comma, and then the second uh, index, T here, is what period we are making the forecast for. So for instance, F2,4 is the forecasted value for time 4, but we made it at time 2. If we are uh, talking in quarters, for instance, is it's the predicted value uh, for the fourth quarter that we made at the end of the second quarter. Now, most of the time, we always uh, predict the same number of periods ahead. So we might be pre predicting one period ahead or one year ahead. In that case, we might not indicate what T minus K is because it's always the same. And in that case, we simply denote uh, Y hat with the hat indicating it's a prediction with only one index, which is T. So it indicates which period the uh, forecasted value is for. Now we talked about the dependent variables. Let's talk about explanatory variables. Most of the time we are going to use time as a, an explanatory variable. So either we put 
the time period directly. So t equals one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Or we can also put transforms, the log of t or t plus t square and any other transform of t you can think of. We might also use instead of t variables that are changing over time. So for instance, if we are predicting the sales, we might look at the price at time t or the advertising spending at time t. Another type of variable that is very popular is to look at values of variable, but maybe one period ago or two periods ago, they are called lagged variables. So here, for instance, you might say that the sales today depend on the sales one day ago when we are making a prediction. So in that case, we include sales, which is the dependent variable, y, but at t minus one. So the dependent variable becomes an explanatory variable as we move ahead in time. You might also use lagged variable of other explanatory variables, like maybe the advertising last week has an effect of my expected sales this week. And of course, you can create any combination of the above. So put t as an explanatory variable and some variables that are changing with time at the current value and some lagged variables so variables that are changing with time, but you are using the past value of this variable. Be careful, do not include any variable that, ne that never changes over time. They are perfectly collinear with uh, constants beta zero in this model. And so you cannot estimate uh, neither beta zero nor the beta that is with the variable that does not change over time. If you are including many variables and you can include many lags or many transforms of time or many other explanatory variables, you still have the issue about overfitting and you could use the same methods as we've already covered in this course. There are two types of very specific correlation patterns that we often find in time series data. The first type is called autocorrelation. It's when a variable is correlated with past values of itself. For instance, the weather on one day might be correlated with the weather one day before, right? If it's cold today, I might expect it to be also cold tomorrow. The other pattern is cross correlation. It's when a variable is correlated with past values, but of other variables. For instance, the number of sales today might be correlated with advertising the week before. Maybe there is some delay when people see an ad they think about buying the product, but it takes a week for them to uh, make the purchase. In that case, we'll find some correlation, but between different variables, advertising and sales, and at different times period. These uh, correlation patterns can both cause violation of the independent errors uh, assumption that we use in regression. To check these uh, assumption and to check what kind of autocorrelation we might be facing, there are usually two things we can look at. First is the autocorrelation of the dependent variable y. So we look at y at one time period and y one time period before or two time periods before and so on and so forth. Or if we have an econometric model, we can uh, run the regression, make predictions and then get the residuals. And then we look at the autocorrelation of the residuals. And that's how we would check the independent error assumption. This uh, autocorrelation is the autocorrelation that is not explained by our model because it's still left in the residual. Autocorrelation can usually be controlled with the inclusion of lagged variables and the choice of uh, which lagged variables to use is more an art uh, than a science. Here is an example of a time series. This is the closing price of the Twitter stock during COVID, so in 2020 and 2021. We can see some linear pattern here, so we can run a linear regression where X is the date, so uh, each point in X advanced by one day or one trading day in that case, weekends are excluded, and the Y variable is the closing price. We can see that once we run the regression, if we look at the residual, there is some clear pattern here where the residual at the beginning, they are all above the line and then they all fall below the line and then they are around the line and so on and so forth. So if I know the value of one residual, 
I might guess the value of the residuals that are next to it, maybe one residual later or one residual uh, before, one time period after or one time period before. So this clearly violates the independence of error assumption because if I know the error at one time period, I can guess the error at neighboring time periods. And my guess is not zero anymore. If the residual is negative, I will guess that the next residual is also negative. One way to check or to understand the autocorrelation pattern is to look at the autocorrelation function or usually called ACF graph. On this graph at the top here, we can see that the x-axis is the number of flag. And then on the y-axis is the autocorrelation. So zero is the correlation between a value and no lag now. So the correlation is perfect. It's a correlation between the value and itself. Of course, it should be one. Then we have the correlation between one value and the same value, uh, the same variable, but one period ago. So in that case, it's you can see it's still fairly high. It's probably at around 0.8 or 0.9. And you can see that as you move backward in time and you look at the correlation between the current value and one lag ago, two lags ago, three lags ago, and so on and so forth, the autocorrelation goes down. So if you look at uh, 15 uh, periods ago, the correlation between the value now and 15 trading days later is almost zero. So if the correlation is, the autocorrelation is small, that's good. But if it's large, like we have between uh, zero and five or zero and 10 lags here, this is a problem. There are two common approaches to test the independent error assumption. So to test if there is autocorrelation or not. The first one is to examine the uh, residual plot and or the ACF graph, like we did just before. What's convenient about this is that you can identify autocorrelation with lags that are uh, further apart, like for instance, a correlation between the current period and seven days before. However, it's not a statistical test, so it will not tell you there is a significant autocorrelation. There are ways to do this, but we are not going to talk about it in this course. Another approach is to use the Durbin-Watson statistic. This is a statistical test, so it will tell you there is a significant autocorrelation or we might not be able to detect the autocorrelation. So we would, in that case, fail to reject the hypothesis that there is uh, no autocorrelation. The value of the Durbin-Watson statistic is between zero and four. The best case for us is to find two. Two means no autocorrelation. If it's closer to zero, so if the statistic is smaller than two, it indicates the presence of a positive autocorrelation. If the value is greater than two, so closer to four, it indicates that there is a negative autocorrelation. That means that if one day we have a value above our prediction, the next day we are likely to have a value below our prediction. That's a negative autocorrelation. Again, this is just for one period behind. In practice, any value between 1.5 and 2.5 is usually considered an acceptable uh, autocorrelation, even if it's significant. It's small enough to be ignored. How you handle uh, the non-randomness of the residual, so the autocorrelation, will depend on the type. If it's a positive autocorrelation, a negative autocorrelation, or an autocorrelation, which is between the current value and maybe seven lags ago. So here I ran a regression of the closing price of the Twitter stock and the closing price of the Twitter stock, the trading day, uh, one period before. You can see that now the autocorrelation almost completely disappeared because actually the closing price at the current period is almost the same as the, as the closing price for, from the period before. It did solve the autocorrelation issue. However, now to make a prediction, I need to know what the closing price was one period just before. If I looked at the previous model, which was just a function of time, I could make a prediction maybe one month ahead or even one year ahead by looking at the trend. Right now, I have to wait the day right before, look at the closing price to make the prediction. So this might not be convenient at all.
So when you think about your model, you have to be very careful about what lag structure you want to use. And this will depend on the type of autocorrelation and what mechanisms you suspect are happening behind this autocorrelation and what you might be interested in doing if you want to predict a far ahead or maybe just one period ahead. So you have to think how the outcomes in uh, one period might depend in, on the actions or the outcomes of other period, whether it's from the same variable, for instance, the prior period rentals may influence current period rentals, that's autocorrelation. Maybe you ran some uh, discount during a week and the people uh, who needed to go somewhere rented a car and went it where they wanted to go. And so they don't need to go anywhere the week after. And so the rentals might go down, for instance, that would be a negative autocorrelation. The rentals might also depend on the prior week advertising levels. If you do a lot of advertising, people will remember that you are a great company to rent a car and go on a road trip on the next week, maybe. So that's cross correlation. How far back should we look? How many lags should we include? Well, that depends on your preference. Some people look at the ACF, so the autocorrelation function of the residual and try to change the model to minimize autocorrelation. Some people might include as many lags as significant. So they might put seven lags in their model, for instance, and uh, see uh, if they are all significant. Some people might use older lags because they want to predict maybe one month ahead. So they can only use a lag that's one month ago. They cannot use the day before lag. Be careful, uh, the same variable selection rule applies uh, as for the standard linear model. And this might be good for prediction to use lags, but I'm not sure about the interpretation. You have to think about what it means in terms of interpretation, because now you have the change in the lagged value that has an effect on your uh, expected value for the current period.